of weeks. This is just a chance to chat cricket, have a bit of fun, ask a few questions. The format will be that I will start with a few questions. And then once we've, uh, we've been running for 20 minutes, we'll, uh, we'll start taking questions from anybody that's, uh, that's joined us for the evening. So type away, send your messages and your questions through, and I will ask uh, Pop and Jim your questions as we go. So I'm happy to answer anything to do with cricket. And uh, it really is an open house, so feel free to, uh, to shout out. Well, gents, firstly, thank you very much for taking the time to join us on your extremely busy calendar. Um, I know you've got loads on at the moment, but uh, look, three months ago, you two were both working flat out to get the first team in particular ready. So you've been through a tough winter, a lot of hard work, a lot of planning. La Manga was on the horizon. Um, that got cut short. You managed to get a week out there and uh, we just need to know, what have you been doing for the last couple of months? Trouts. Good evening, everyone. Um, hope everyone's safe and well. Um, yeah, it's been uh, interesting times, Barbie, really. I mean, from, from the time we escaped Spain and got, got ourselves back in, just uh, felt like the nick of time. Um, things sort of escalated that week, didn't they? That's when the, the, the news started coming out and the severity of lockdown um, developed. Um, you know, the long and short of it is, you know, in, pers in perspective, you know, I'm safe and healthy. I'm a little bit bored and I'm itching to get out there and so are all the guys. But at the end of the day, there we go. Charles, <laughs> you've muted for some reason. Who's that? Yeah. Okay. I didn't do it. I just think. I it just shows that we're live. We've not recorded it. <laughs> we're live. So there you go. Okay, I didn't touch it. I'll put my hands up here. I'll prove it. Um, <laughs> so I don't know what you heard up to. <laughs> what did I get to? <laughs> we got to, uh, where did we get to? You got to, uh, just evaded the lockdown in Spain. So we managed to get oh, you out right. just before the borders were closed. All oh, right. I, I, I said some gold dust stuff to that. Um, <laughs> so yeah, just evaded, just evaded lockdown, got back. Things started to develop, obviously, that, that week we got back, really the severity of what lockdown was going to be. And really, the, the long and short of it since then, it's been lots of Zoom meetings, a um, bit of homeschooling, um, click and collect, you know, the usual thing that people are having to do um, without me, you know, having to do the fantastic stuff that the NHS workers and all these key workers are doing at the moment to keep the country running. So, um, we, you know, we stay in touch as a management. We, we make sure we, we listen to the, the government's guidelines, the ECB guidelines, and we got ourselves as ready as we possibly can for hopefully when we get the green light for the domestic season. Brilliant. And Pop, you're the, you're the lucky one, I guess, in the coaching setup at the moment. You finally managed to uh, get outside and spend some time with, uh, with some players. Yeah, like Jim said, um... We uh, we left the manga, and we think we had a bit of a we had a bit of a look at what lockdown was like because everybody started to panic in Spain. So for that first week, was um, we had an idea of what it was going to be like, and then it kicked in, and obviously it's been it's a terrible time in the world and everything. Um, but the last few months have just been trying to keep myself busy, been keeping in touch with the lads the odd time. Um, they've been sending some balling videos by the being going out by themselves and their. Own. I was spare time in that hour three to, um, to do some training. Um, and like you said, luckily enough, I've been um, asked to work with Chris Walks, um, uh, Ollie Stone and Moin Ali um, for the next four or five weeks, trying to prepare them for the, um, so hopefully the test, you know, I think it's June, I'm, uh, July, I'm not really sure. But um, that was good to get back in edge Baston. It was a bit eerie there, you know what I mean? Everybody having to keep social distancing and masks and everything like that. But... It was good to see the lads again. It was good to see Walksy. Um, obviously, he's had he's had a couple of months off um, after a hectic year with the Ashes uh, and the World Cup. Uh, Ollie Stone's been ticking over, so he's he's looking really good. And, um, uh, Mo and Ali comes in tomorrow to do some work, but it was just nice to get out. Nice to get the teeth stuck back into it. Um, start thinking of coaching again because obviously the last few months have been it's been difficult for everybody. Like you said, the NHS has been brilliant. Um, so it was nice to just get out in the sun and, and, and watch them actually turning the, the arms over. 
And what, um, what, what's the key thing? So, we, you know, everybody will have read that the England bowlers are back. We, we know that this is step one or stage one. So the bowlers are bowling into, you know, we've seen pictures of, you know, I think Stuart Board's kept us up to date. I've seen footage of you being in the middle of Edge Baston. Um, so with Wokesy, Wokesy told a bit of a story the other day that they're literally bowling into a net. What, what's yeah. your... What's your goal for them over these three weeks, the initial starting back to bowling period? Yeah, well, um, like I mentioned before, Walksy, who's um, he played in the World Cup last year, obviously it took a lot out of him physically and mentally. Um, and he's been he's been on the treadmill of um, international cricket for the last few years. So with him, he, he's he's just had time off. He's had a couple of months. He's um, expected to be in September, I think. Um, he spent time with the family, which a lot of international cricketers haven't done. Over the, you don't know that far, you're aware that much. But it's difficult spending time with your family, so he's um, he hasn't picked up a ball for two months. So, so yesterday, what we did is we just got him running through a few, get some, get him, tried to get some a um, little bit of rhythm. We broke his action back, so first of all, in from bound um, into a couple of paces, and he bowled probably two overs at full intensity, whereas um, Ollie Stone. Who's had who had a great winter? He's uh, he recovered really, really well from his injury, um, and he puts a lot of work in in the winter and bowled like an absolute legend in um, in La Manga, which was very good. So he was ready to go then, um, which he, he's disappointed um, that he can't. He, he he didn't kick on. It didn't. Well, basically, things stopped then. But to the both at two different stages. Walks his back to bowling program, so we're going to take it a little bit easy with him over the next few weeks. But Oli, we're just trying to ramp his workloads up to get to about 35 overs a week, which is what the series, what happens in test matches. And Jim, in terms of you know the, the rest of the players on the, the Warwickshire staff, and it'll be the same around the country, you know, the, the, the physical side is one thing that Pop's talking about there. The mental battle for the players having you know worked really hard through the winter they get themselves to spain they're looking forward to coming back from spain and starting a county season it's tough when that that comes to a halt it's, it's a bit like you know a player has an injury it's hard sometimes picking them up and getting them going again restoring their confidence but it is such an unusual time i'm guessing there's a lot of emphasis on the mental well-being of the rest of the players yeah i mean look as cricketers, that part, waiting is part of the game. <laughs> and um, th this is obviously taking it to the extreme. It's been a difficult time. You know, you get yourself prepped over a long, dark winter. And the, and the guys train incredibly hard over that winter. Uh, you know, as all the counties um, would have done. You know, some, some counties cancelled pre-seasons before flying out. So, you know, the, 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 the blip that everyone's had and this delay has been you know, something no one's ever thought would happen or experienced before, you know, being not doing cricket this time of the year, especially we just had a bank holiday Monday. That's probably the first bank holiday Monday any cricketer or coach has had off um, in their professional career. Yeah, keeping um, keeping those guys' um, well-being at the forefront, which is one of the key things when we sat down as a manager, you know, what do we need to make sure we prioritise? The first is the safety and the well-being of, of the players. You know, are they healthy and then they you know, physically healthy in terms of the virus, but are they also got to make sure we look out for them? This is not going to be easy. Um, and you know we have we have apps that these guys fill in that we, we can keep keep a check on how they're doing well being wise how many hours sleep they're getting you know what the mood's like just to just to highlight any red flags um, and as this season's gone on um, and you get different you know ideas of when it might start you know there's guys who, who are scratching their head thinking no is it going to um, got guys out of contract you got young guys start of their career wanting to really, you know, make improvements in their game. You've got the guys at the back end of the career, you know, who have announced retirement, who've got what they thought was probably their last season to be able to to play this game that they love playing. So there's a real mixture in the squad of, of people's situations. You've just got to be very aware that, you know, it's a difficult time because you're just having to wait and, and see. And, and just in terms of that, you know, you, you highlight obviously that you've got players at different stages of their careers. I mean, as a coach, you know, a lot of the guys that are joining us tonight will be coaching in club cricket. Some will still be playing. There is no difference in the game, whether you're playing for, you know, a village third eleven, whether you're playing for Warwickshire first eleven. But the, the mental side of the game, the mental battles are the bits that 
perhaps are the toughest to fix at times, and yet it's very much a mental game, isn't it? Yeah, you know, it doesn't change whether you're playing club cricket, youth cricket, um, professional cricket, international cricket. There's still the same, the same mental um, difficulties that you're going to have, you know, with form, with, with your technique, with your game, with your performance, with the team-wise, your individual-wise. They're all the sort of similar things that everyone has to deal with. And, you know, a lot is played upstairs. You know, the difference between the players that excel, I think, are the who, other than incredibly strong work ethic um, and an ability to adapt and improve um, whatever challenges are thrown at them, is the ability to deal with the ups and downs of cricket. This is um, this is a severe test that's probably a test that no one's had. We're almost, like you said, everyone's experiencing a stress fracture and they're out for you know three months. You know, can't do anything. And and, and you know, having had injury before, you know that feeling of not being involved, not being able to, not going to the ground, not being able to play. That's the kind of feeling I get. You know, even putting this shirt on for this this interview, I feel a bit sad because it's the first time I put it on for for a long time. You know, being able to just go to work, um, and the guys will be exactly the same. You know, I, I do feel for them. And pop, just in terms of um, Wokesy and Ollie Stone. I mean, again, they're two people at very different stages of their international career. You know, Wokesy has been someone that you know appears to have been in around the England team for many, many years, but it's actually been in the last few years that he's cemented a place. Certainly in, in one day cricket has been you know absolutely nailed on. He's your go-to man. I'll be shouting at the TV like a lot of people at the World Cup final that he should be bowling the super over. And yet again, Morgs proved that it was quite a good decision bowling Joffa. But what works he is at that stage where we all look at him as a, a senior England international. Stoney burst onto the scene, Sri Lanka, you know, bowled the absolute gem of a first over in international cricket um, and then has had a couple of injuries. Do, do you deal with those two in different ways, mentally? Is, is there a different way of talking to them because of where they're at in their careers? Yeah, um, with Walksy, for instance, I've known Walksy for a long time, okay, and he's always been a kind of person that um, he knew what he wants, he knew how he was going to get it and that's where he was going to go. So. To somebody like Walksy and his experience and an international, and I speak to him the other day, he's a World Cup winner for him. There's not many people that can say that, you know what I mean? Um, and I think he's at a stage in his career where I did the other days. I just throw things out, ask him questions, see what he wants to do. It's his session. How does he like to do it? Where with Ollie, who's probably trying to break into that, and obviously 10, uh, about eight years younger and less experienced, because Ollie hasn't played much experience. It's a little bit more tell and guide to Ollie. Yeah. Whereas with Walksy, it's Chris, what do you want to do? And have you tried this? You know what I mean? So there's, there's different ways of approaching different people at different stages of their career, different talents and also. So the bottom line bit, for me, it basically comes down to getting to know the individual, getting to know how they tick, getting to know what makes them work and using that accordingly when you're trying to speak to them. So just, just on that then, you're saying that with someone like Stoney, he's played a lot of county cricket. You know, he, he, he moved from Northampton to Warwickshire to enhance his international cricket to win trophies. He's got himself in that international picture. He played a test match last year. He, he's played one day internationals. Um, it's still okay to tell them. It's not all about asking. There are times as a coach yeah. that you're telling. Yeah, yeah, well, this is the thing. If you have that relationship with them, um, he's able to tell you sometimes, you know what I mean? That's the thing. So it's, I think it's just trying to gauge, um, gauge when's the right time to use certain kinds of words for these people. For instance, if we, when, when Walksy played, I think it was last year in the 50 overs, I wanted him to bowl more bounces, but he was trying to be a little bit safe. And I know that Walksy can be quite safe as well, you know? So there was a little bit of a, a little bit of a communication there. There's a little bit of, no one say falling out, but there was, I believe you should be doing this, Chris. Um, and he tried it, and it was another tool in his bag, but it took a lot of time to try and get it through to him, if you understand what I'm saying. Yeah. And, and so, Trout, in terms of for really understanding your players, as Pop's talking about there, I mean, that, for me, that would be the biggest change. And when we all started... Playing. I know Trout, you're a bit younger than me and Pop, but Pop and I have had the occasional run in. We had a few words at Luxbridge, which he's never let me forget. I, I was just saying how, I good good player, right. how good a player I thought he was. And, you know, I thought we'd be unlucky not to be playing more first team cricket. And he's 
held a grudge with me ever since in the Middlesex Warwickshire days, uh, which I find hard that he doesn't let go of it now. But anyway, so w- w- the, the game has changed, though, hasn't it? In terms of coaching, in terms of, and Pops talked about it, you mentioned it there, the, the, the way that coaches perhaps when we started playing to where coaches interact now has definitely changed. And, and what do you reckon the biggest change has been from a coaching point of view, Travis? That's a good question. I mean, you, you, all you look to look back on as a player is the coaches that you learned from, you know, the good and the bad. <laughs> I do think that there are going to be some, that there's going to be some stuff that you, you think moving forward that you might not use. Um, you know, elements from when we were growing up and probably the era you're talking about when you guys were growing up was a bit more old school. You know, it was probably a bit more tell, a bit more autocratic, a bit more straight down the line, tell you exactly what you need to hear. Now, I'm not to say that there's not an element of that that's actually needed nowadays that sometimes gets viewed unfavourably in terms of how you deal with your players. But really, whether or not the, you had a coach who was quite strong, someone like Neil Abley, who, who brought, you know, a lot of the players that came through Warwickshire's ranks you know he had a very tough way of, of, of bringing you up as a player he told you exactly what he thought he didn't mince his words and it was a tough school and it was a good school in that way um, the key to all of it whether or not you, you you more naturally like that or maybe the other way is is the relationship that you get with your player in the first place because you're not going to be able to get your message across you're not going to be able to put an arm around the shoulder or or give him a kick up the arse if you don't have that that level ground where you, you actually know that person as a human being because, you know, I've worked with coaches who've got a lot of really good ideas, but if they didn't learn about me as a player, you, you, you're not sure whether or not is it for their benefit or, or for your benefit. So I think, I think there's elements that have changed in the game. Um, I think probably the biggest one for me being a player from when I first started to, to when I ended my career and now as a coach has been, you know, 12-month contracts have been a big thing. Um, used to be turn up 1st of March. You know, you turn up the 1st of March for the bleep test, um, off you go, go and play your season, go find something to do in the winter. Um, and now, you know, in terms of how much, you know, uh, the medical side of it, the strength and conditioning side of it, the professionalisation of that kind of element of cricket has changed as well. Um, but, there, you know, sometimes it's a simple game and it's made difficult. Um, and I know from being a player and a coach that it can be extremely difficult. Some make it a lot easier. Um, but those coaches, if they have that relationship and be able to, at the right moment, at the right time, give that information, it's, it's, it's something that, whether it's in the past or right now, all those coaches have similar traits. And, and it, are there times where you, know the, you think you know the answer, but actually because you've learned about the player and there's someone that likes to learn themselves and not be told, the times you have to just be patient and let them almost fall over and scuff their knees a couple of times before you pick them up and give them a bit of a pat on the back? Yeah, at the end of the day, these guys have got to go out and make decisions in the middle. Um, now, obviously, if there's something, if it's a safety issue in terms of their you know, bowling action, you think this is going to yeah. ruin your you know, Or if someone's gone through a very long, barren piece of form and there's something that's crying out um there is an, some, some of the younger players you might think actually this is part of their journey they might be a little bit stubborn to listen so you've got to let them fall over because to be fair you learn a hell of a lot out of losing and, and failure you know as much as you do out of winning you know you could win a game against the lesser opposition and you don't really learn much because you don't go out of second gear if you lose to that team that's lesser than you you'll learn a lot about complacency if you lose to a team or a player or one-to-one with an individual who's, who's much better than you you've got to learn what they do and to learn how why are they better than you so having those moments where we have quite a young quite a lot of youngsters in in the squad and sometimes we just we're sort of toying with that idea we just pick them up and tell them you've got to do this right now or this is part of their journey they're not going to learn unless they do it themselves and find out for themselves you might have someone who's slightly more experienced something might be happening in their technique that they're not quite remembering that you might have to then that's probably the more delicate is someone who's scored a lot of runs but you see something developing in their technique whether it's their action whether it's their position on you know release from the bowler that's just creeping in they just need a little bit of reminding and that's probably you know the 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 delicate nature of, of dropping that into conversation is probably a bit more subtle than if you've got a youngster and Pop, it would be fair to say that, you know, and I'm sure everything that Jim's talking about there, I, I certainly am with him. I, I guess you are as well. But the, 
some of your best sessions aren't necessarily done in a net. So you're, you know, you're renowned for being one of England's best bowling coaches. You've had a great reputation um, for a long time now as a bowling coach. Um, but some of your best sessions aren't necessarily, I can see with the ball in your hand now, um, but they're not always done in a net, are they? They're, they're sometimes done over a coffee, you know, it might be over a Coca-Cola at night, whatever it might be, it might be over breakfast in the morning. You find the opportunity and it's a case of getting the right time to get your message across sometimes. Yeah, 100%, Fabi. It was like we're talking, going back when I started to play, when I learned the game, it was in the bar. That might say many times, in the bar, listening to the umpire saying, this is where you should ball here. What do you think about that? This was a wrong decision there. And you take it all in, you start to build a little rapport up with people on the field so you're able to discuss cricket. Um, society's moved on a little bit now, you know what I mean? There's not enough, the people don't go for a drink, it's all protein shakes, it's different. So you've got to try and manufacture those, um, manufacture is probably not the wrong word, the right word, but you've got to try and make time to try and steal some time to be able to try and get your, your, your message across. Listen to what this in a in a non-threatening environment. You know, there's there's loads of way. What I try and do with the, the bowlers, the group of bowlers, it's not about the individual bowler. It's about the whole sum of them. So I try and get them to discuss bowling things. I'll put things on WhatsApp. I'll just try and promote conversation within the group, and they start owning that group itself. So they start policing that group itself, which as a coach, that's what you want to do. You want to try and eventually make yourself redundant where you're able to stop back, step back and just oversee. Um, so you're spot on. As long as it's, 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 it comes back to the relationship where you're, able, you're able, where you're able to try and discuss things in different environments and basically try and get the message across. That's, that's, that's how it works. Basically, probably, I like bowling. I love bowling. I could talk bowling till the cows come home. So anybody wants to talk bowling with me, I'm quite happy to speak for hours on them. And this group of lads we've got, they love bowling more than me. So they're, um, they're just, they, there's a group developing there where they're all respect each other, they all want to bowl for each other, and they just talk bowling. So that's what I've tried to create there. Fantastic. Travis, is there a danger and, and you both talked about here about you know getting to know your players. I, I'm, I'm a massive believer in that. You can't you can't help anyone until you know what they want from you. And every player wants something different from you. It doesn't matter who they are. Whether they played 100 Test matches, whether they played one Test match, three County games, everyone wants something different. And you can only help them if you know what it is they want. Is there a danger that in a game that is massively about making the right decision at the right time? If, if we have too many coaches around and too many support staff, there is a danger that we can, without meaning to, perhaps sometimes take the decision making away from them and actually make too many decisions for them that when they come to a game, they're not quite sure what to do. Is there a danger of that? I think so. I do. I think um, we all want to be organised as coaches. We want, we want to be able to plan sessions and absolutely nail them and be able to tick off things that we need to work on, identify areas we need to improve the squad, include our, improve our players. But sometimes the chaotic sessions, like you said, can be real gold dust. You know, we, we made a conscious effort this winter of moving away from three or four hours of one-to-ones, you know, guys coming in an hour at a time, we feed the bottom machine, we do a bit of claw. We obviously work on their games, but it was quite, um, quite a sterile environment where we're here for you for an hour and bang, we'll, 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 we'll tick off that session. We had more sessions where four batters came in at the same time. You've got three coaches to work with you. You've got two hours. What do you need? To start them thinking, what do I need at this session? What do I need to work on, on my game? Is it scenario-based? Is it anything technical? Is there something about my routines that I need to work on to nail? So really, I mean, it did have a few, it raised a few eyebrows at first because they're used to what they're used to. Guys like, you know, you know, they like the consistency of knowing what's happening. Um, but by the end of it, it definitely felt that the sessions were more organic, the sessions were more run by the players, players partnering up, players working with each other, talking to each other about each other's games. Because like Pop said, with phones, sometimes after a day's play, and I get called an old fart in our dressing room because I'm very, I'm pretty, get pretty annoyed about phones being out and give yourself time after an inning or time after a day's play to talk to the bloke opposite you rather than check on Twitter. I do think that's an element that, that, that it's not in the game as much, talking about your game to others. Um, there's so many things as players, as a player, there's so many things I learned from the bloke at the other end or 
my teammate that I knew me and it could just be a little word that a coach couldn't have had the same impact. Um, so I do think don't, don't cover all the bases. Those guys have got to trip, them, trip over them because they're not, they're not going to learn quickly if they're constantly, you know, assisted, you know, and put perfectly through um, all the gates to get to where they need to get to. They've got to find out it's not as easy as that. Absolutely right. I'm going to go to Howard. He's got a question for you both. Howard wants to know, is there anything from outside of cricket that's influenced or improved your coaching? Great question, Howard. I'll start with Trouts. I think outside cricket. Um, outside of cricket that's ever influenced you in terms of your thinking as a coach or your behaviour? Yeah, I think, you know, we, I think my family... In terms of uh, in terms of my upbringing, in terms of my my family, in terms of wife and kids, I've learned a lot from from having children. That's definitely um, you know I know we've got a young squad, not quite as young as my two girls, but there's <laughs> definitely you definitely see parallels with getting messages across. Because you go from being a player where you manage your own game uh, and you you know exactly what you need to do to get to get better, you're now managing you know a class you know and, and a group of young players who are all on their journey. Um, my old man, in terms of the job he did, I learned a lot in terms of how he would sort of um, separate his job from his family life. So that kind of, in, ter in terms of dealing with the pressures of being a coach, because it's not, you can't have any control over the result yourself. You have to, you know, put people in a position to deliver their skill and win your games of cricket. You know, we've had times in pre-seasons where we've gone, we've, you know, beasted the guys and, you know, at army camps to... to truly see what an autocratic um, tell environment is, which has, which does have in very small portions, has uh, a lot of relevance in terms of under pressure, out of your comfort zone, making decisions very quickly. Um, I think those, have, those are sort of highlights definitely for me. Um, and, you know, dealing with adversity, I think from your cricketing um, career, you know, you have a lot of downs. I had a few, I had a fair few downs in my career. You know, so getting used to that and knowing how hard the game is is definitely how we coach guys uh, through their games. Well, anything from outside the game that's influenced you? Um, well, like Jim said, my dad, my dad loves the game. He played up north, um, and he he comes in wherever I am, whether I was playing or whether I was coaching. He tries to come down and watch. Um, and he will tell me the truth, you know what I mean? I might be around the bush a bit, but he will just tell me the truth. Um, I try to do a lot of reading for me. I try to listen to a lot of um, points of view. I recently read um, um, Woodward's book. I listen to a lot of psychology things. Um, yeah, just try, and, just try and test myself. Um, I've been out of the game for twice in my career, once when I was injured. Um, it gave me a reality check, and the other time when I left Derby, it gave me a reality check where I went back to my roots, coaching children, coaching kids, and got the appetite for it back. Um, so I'm always on the lookout for everything, anything, anything that's on the telly, anything. So I'm, I'm always looking for any any little angle, psychological, um, tactic, anything, anything business from business. So. Um, I do a lot of reading, so there's a there's a lot of things that's moulded me into plus the coaches I've worked with. I know it's um, outside of cricket, but there's been a lot of influences who've um, who've moulded how I think and how I am as a coach and a, and a person actually. Okay, um, one from Sean here. Sean wants to know what the two of you have in your bag that is the most essential piece of coaching equipment that you have. Do I go first? Yeah, you go first this time. Go for it. <laughs> My mitt. I love, I love a mitt. Um, the thing is, when we've had this, this oh, I think I went through a couple of few years ago with Ollie Stone balling at it. Um, it's got, I've got the big, it's supposed to be a catcher's mitt. Um, is it a catcher's mitt? I don't, I've got one of them, but I've got the biggest, the biggest mitt you can get because obviously the, the ball wobbles. Um, and they don't last very long when the ball keeps hitting them that hard. Um, so I'd say that was my most important, my most important thing in the kit bag. <laughs> Mine is my kit bag because I basically have to lug around <laughs> all the all the bits from the coaching staff, save on to save on luggage. Yeah, I, I think your claw, your mitt as a as a coach is your, your two favoured thing. Maybe, maybe my little phone bat, you know, my, my little fielding bat. They'll be my three tools of the trade. Don't know where any of my cricket kit's gone since I retired. It ended up in the 
one of the storage rooms to, that Robin, our, our dressing room attendant, looks after. I, I'm sure it's got plenty of mothballs on it now. Um, but yeah, they would be, you know, you need your equipment ready in the morning. So that bag is, is gold dust to me in terms of keeping things ready, cones and, uh, and bats and lots of balls. Um, my mitt would be uh, very important to me. Okay, brilliant. Um, ben Hughes has asked a question about players heading towards retirement. Ben, I'll answer that. We're, we're very lucky that we have the PCA, Professional Cricket Association, and each county has a player development welfare officer who, it, since certainly since Pop and I started, you know, that the PCA has developed and improved unbelievably. And as Jim mentioned earlier, we were part-time professional cricketers. We had a job in the winter and we joined up end of March, beginning of April. We played for six months and off we went to our second job or in some cases our first job. Um, nowadays, professionals, they're 12 months of the year. They get fantastic support from the PCA and every player pretty much is working through something else to set them up for when cricket finishes. Um, and I think that's been the greatest thing, greatest amount of support that the Players Association give their players and really work hard with them. And as clubs, we work very closely with the PTA. So there are definitely plans in place. Not all of them want to be coaches. Some of them do. Some of them are going to media. Some of them want to go into other aspects. Liam Plunkett is a great example. Fantastic career. Wants to become a strength and conditioning coach. And he's been working at that for the last couple of years, despite playing for England. That's been one of the things he wants to do. And we've got people in our squad who are definitely looking at diverse options. But Pop, I'm going to come back to you for the other part of Ben's question. Um, what would you say your go-to communi communication strategy is to develop a relationship with players? Do you have a strategy or is it just a case of just spend time with them? Listening. Listen to what they say. Listen to how they say it. Observe how... There's one player, um, we, we, I'll, I'll not name his name, who he... he, he he worked, he's like my son at 20, I think he's about 23, 24, but he gets up every morning and it's the last thing he wants to do. So every time he comes into the ground, he's got a face as long as a fiddle. He doesn't greet anybody because he's half asleep. Um, so I've made a conscious effort to go over the top every single time I see him, whether he's walking over the nets or something, I'll shout from the distance just to try and get under his skin to wake him up a little bit. But uh, that's just one tool I use with one of the players. Um, but it's listening. Listen, it's listening to what they're saying, Fabi. It's listening to asking them questions about their family. Listening to how they say it. Um, listening to how they how they answer the questions. Um, and you can just start building up a up a picture of how they work. You know what I mean? Asking the right questions and listening to the, the answers that they say. Fantastic. Pop, we got one here from Peter. He wants to know the young bowlers starting in next now. Um, now that they're open, what level of weekly load should we be putting these bowlers through to ease them back into bowling? It, it all depends on the ages, Fabi. You know what I mean? There's a different age groups for everything like that. Okay, give um, us an idea. It's say a 13-year-old boy or girl just starting back. They've had a break for a couple of months. What sort of workload? 13-year-old and then a 15-year-old. What sort of workload would you be asking for? Um, Workloads, I think it's, it's about them having fun. First of all, getting out there again, having fun. Um, getting some, because they've obviously they haven't had much exercise over the, over the last couple of months. Um, just letting them go as much as, as much as possible. I don't think you can really put workloads on them. Um, try and make it fun for them. Um, but obviously, you, they can't be bowling 20, 30 hours a day. You know what I mean? You've got to look after them. But I just think at this moment in time, just let them go and have some fun, expend some energy over the next couple of months, you know, because uh, they've been locked up the last couple of months. Um, as they probably get older, that's where you've got to be careful, that they're not bowling too many back-to-back -back days um, and too many spells a day. But it's, it's, just, it's just being sensible, really. Do you know what I mean? It, especially, um, like I said, especially as they've been cooped up for the last few months. I, don't, I wouldn't put anything specifically on them. It's just um, see how they're getting on. Okay, and again, I guess a lot would depend on their physical ability. Yeah, so yeah. if you've got someone who's a bit fitter, you're happy for them to bowl a little bit more. Um, yeah. But uh, but you, I'm guessing you're not saying 25, 30 overs a day for a 13-year-old who's just starting back. You're saying 
you know, you're building him up to that period, aren't you? Yeah, use your common sense. Basically, what basically what I'm doing with Chris Walks. Chris Walks yeah. has got six weeks left. You know, I didn't get him running in ball ten overs the other day. Yeah. He just built back slowly. He probably bowled around medium intensity, about four or five overs, just to get the blood flowing again. So don't be silly with it. You know what I mean? But let let them enjoy it. But just be aware that they can't. They're not. You don't want to pile them in the ground. Okay. And, and Trouts, we we hear a lot about. Um, the mental side, we've touched on the mental side. Mental toughness is a phrase that I hear a lot about. Question here, can you coach mental toughness? Yeah, I, I believe you can because really mental toughness, the, the, the elements we're talking about in cricket is your perceived ability to deal with the perceived situation. That's it, really. You know, whether or not you think you're good enough in that moment of time to deal with what's put in front of you, whether you're a bowler coming in against the batter and the conditions are in favour of him, and the game's in favour of him or, or the other way around. You're a batter who's coming in against a very good bowler in a difficult situation. The way you try and grow that mental robustness is you know, another term you could use is you've got to try and recreate those in practice. So then it's not an alien thing that they're going to experience in a game. If they're having to make huge leaps in a game, then you're not getting your practice right, in my view. There's always going to be time for... Yeah, your nice stuff, your fluffy stuff, and, they, and you know that that's really down to the player to get in, to get that kind of stuff. But as a coach, you're doing them a disservice, I think, if you're not creating situations, creating environments in practice that will help them deal with difficult situations that are going to test them mentally. Don't get me wrong; there are players who naturally have a lot of these traits, and what really separates them is their ability to learn. So, whatever. It's almost like a computer game. They come in and they're level seven and someone comes up and goes, well, can you get to level 12? And they put something in front of them and they, they work it out and they go, okay, this is what I need to do. And then they, they do it again. And we, you know, you see that. Awokes is a perfect example of that. It's people who you just see them and think, we, we're there as coaches, but really their development, they've got a lot of the, the, the raw minerals to make sure that they can develop very quickly under most circumstances. Others might take a little bit longer. You know, maturity wise, they might take a little bit longer belief in their own ability their technique might need a little bit more work but if i think you've just got to try and keep recreating stuff that test them so then when they do go out in the middle and they're you know they, they come into the crease from three wickets down and it's going all over the show or a bowler's you know giving the ball and it's it's getting old and two batters are in and you know the the, the field spread there it's not something that they're thinking cry i don't i don't know i've never experienced this situation yeah. Yeah, so never being surprised by what they encounter in a game. No, Helps no. Fantastic. Pop, um, Kaylin wants to know, do you use other sports such as uh, baseball, athletics, to get ideas on new training ideas um, to help your, help your players, help your bowlers in particular? Yeah, well, um, I've got a good relationship with uh, Jack Murphy from the, um, the S&C. I'm sure he wouldn't mind me saying doesn't really know much about cricket. So he's been into basketball, uh, lateral movements. He's done. Um, he's looked into the the, fit, the, the movements in football. Um, so it's just trying to source as much information as you can. Rugby. He's got a lot of rugby, and uh, and there is always a crossover in all sports. You know, there's, there's a lot of um, individual things, but there is a crossover. So Jack, uh, we in collaboration this winter, we put a few of the drills together. Um, which he picked up from rugby, which tried to build the lad's resilience and um, robustness a little bit, because that was earmarked at the, at the beginning of the winter. So yeah, I try and look in every sport. Um, and like I said, with Jack, we, we collaborate well to, to come together, to put things together, to just try to think outside the box a little bit. Fantastic. And a qu question here from Anthony. Anthony, I'm going to answer this one. Just give the two lads a moment to have a drink if they want one. But y your question is, would we like to see a Warwickshire side, a development side in the Birmingham League? Well, I, I, for many years when I was at Kent, I used to think getting a team in the Kent League would be a great idea. Really challenge the young lads from 14 to 19, maybe have a couple of senior players, maybe have a pro that wasn't in the team at the time playing with them. I then went to Yorkshire and realised that Will Rhodes is a great example, our new captain. For probably two years, he played in the Yorkshire Academy team that played in the Yorkshire League. He batted number six, seven and bowled about four overs every week because the team was full of eight bowlers and nine batters. And yet, if he'd been playing for his local team in York, 
He'd been batting four and bowling 12 overs. And not only that, it, they'd also been learning from good experienced club cricketers at their clubs. And both guys have mentioned earlier, players learn from players. So the more, the different environments, the different players that they get to work with and to play with and to learn from, and I have absolutely no doubt, playing adult cricket as a kid helped my game no end. I'm sure the other two would say exactly the same. And there is a danger that if we have a, a Warwickshire team in the Birmingham League, they will be with the same coaches and the same players day in, day out. So I think having to be a Warwickshire young cricketer playing at a club brings pressure and it's also a bit of a test for them. And I watched quite a few of our young players last year playing league cricket and I could see that not only they were they getting good opportunity to bat and bowl their overs, but they were also expected to perform. Because when you're a young player with a Warwickshire shirt or jumper on, and people who know that you're in the Warwickshire setup, people expect you to play well. And if you do play well, they say, well, they should do, because uh, you know, they involve Warwickshire. If they don't, how on earth are they on the Warwickshire setup? So I think that added pressure that comes with playing for their clubs is really, really good. So that would be my, my view. Um, I'm not going to ask the other two. I'm going to move on here. So, Pop, you're looking at a group of young bowlers. Is there one thing that you look for that makes someone stand out more than others? Is it pace? Is it swing? Is it height? What are the attributes that you're really looking for for a young bowler? And that comes from Matt. Yeah, well, um, I try to put this down to a little bit of a checklist, Fabi. Um, so the things that, are pro it's probably not just one thing you're looking for. You're looking for a number of things, and I'll, I'll just say them now. The first thing is pace. As we know, no batter likes pace, and extreme pace as well. It gets the beans going, feet and the hands get in different places, and you have a chance. So that's number one for me, the pace. The second is bounce. Whether you're a tall bowler, if you've just got a good wrist and you stand your wrist behind it a lot, then um, bounce gets good players out. Third one is lateral movement. If you can get the ball off the straight somehow, whether it's seam, whether it's swing, whether it's reverse swing, whatever it may um, wobble seam, whatever it may be, if you can get that ball off that straight, um, and the next one is accuracy. You look at all the best bowlers that have ever lived. They've had most of these things, to be honest. You look at uh, James Anderson, um, England's best ever bowler. Um, he's got swing, he's got bounce, um, he bought, he's accurate. Um, but the one thing that nobody really mentions is you've got to have some heart, you've got to have some ticket, you've got to want to do the hard yards. At five, half 5.30 on a, on, a, on a red hot day where you've got two wickets a day, you've got to want that ball all the time. So I would say those things, them, them things, pace, bounce, lateral movement, accuracy, and you've got to have a desire to be want, want to do all those things. So if you, I'd say in international cricket, they've probably got four. Um, if you look at um, some sort of county bowlers, they may just have three. But the further you go, the higher you go, the more I reckon you need those attributes to be a, to be a bowler. So I hope that answered the question. I've got a bit of time. Definitely. One from Richard for you, Pop. We'll follow on as you're flying at the moment. And talking about flying, what sort of pace? is Chris Wokes bowling at the moment. And how do you build the speed back up over a period of time? What, what can you do to help him build his speed up and get his speed up? So where's, what speed is he now? When he's bowling really well, what is his speed? And, yeah. what sort, and what sort of things can you do as a coach to help him build those speeds up? Yeah, well, I look to it back to when I first came to Warwickshire in 2010. Um, Wokes, he could swing it. He, he could swing it, but he wasn't. He didn't have those other attributes. He, he didn't get the bounce on it. He didn't really. He wasn't really quick enough. He was accurate. So what we try to do over those years is give him some pace. So we try to get him bigger at the crease, as big as he could. And then what happened? Then he lost his swing a little bit. So it was a little bit of a trade-off. So I think Chris Wokes' optimum pace is about 83, 84 where he can get the ball shaping and pitch it up and get it to bounce. He's probably balling um, probably about 79, 78 mile an hour. So he's just cruising in a little bit, but there's still evidence of that shape. There's still evidence of that accuracy and there's still evidence of that bounce. So um, try and get him, when he's balling about 83, 83, 84, that's when I reckon he's, it is, he's, in, he's in a good place. 
And it would be fair to say, wouldn't it, that, and, and I've had this discussion with many people, um, and certainly journalists over the years around the England team, because Wokesy is so smooth on the eye, and he, and he comes in very nicely, and he always looks, you know, nice lad, he never has too much to say, whatever. People think that he's not as quick as he, I mean, no, there are times, he is England's quickest bowler, and he hits yes. 89, yes. 90 miles an hour. People don't yes. see that, because he's so smooth and accurate with his, yeah. with his approach. But that's fair, isn't it? Yeah, I think there was, a, there, was a, there was a stage where not everybody bowls 90 miles an hour a day, you know what I mean, Fab? There's certain days that you come in and out of it. But there was a stage, I reckon, probably a few years ago, Woxie, he was quick. And it hits the bat hard. It, it, it's relating to that, what I'm talking about, the bounce. He hits the splice hard. People can't get at him. And with that shape, and with that accuracy. Well, that's why he's been for England now, you know what I mean? That's why he's got yes. test wickets. That's why he's won the World Cup. Um, he is a lot quicker than you think. He's what we, what we class is a lot heavier. He's a heavier bowler than you think. Yeah, yeah. Trouts, you must have been watching the last dance with Michael Jordan. Um, the, have you? Yep. Definitely. I knew you would. I knew you would. Um, any key learnings from that? And, in, and the <coughs> other part, this is from Peter, and the other part which is interesting is, in cricket matches, who matches Michael Jordan's intensity? It's a good question for you. Blimey, okay. Who's that? I mean... The, the, the first thing that I said, I think I said it earlier about what separates those elite, you know, the, the people who stand head and shoulders above the rest is, <clears throat> is the, the work ethic and the competitive nature that these guys have. Someone like Michael Jordan, it showed there, you know, I'm not all the way through the series at the moment. I'm, I'm you know, sort of seeing a very balanced view of how things are going at the moment and, and the sort of more of a struggle between the players and, and the hierarchy. <clears throat> um, things that struck me from that have been, you know, the drive of, of, of Jordan, the, the sort of um, the light bulb moment where they were going to be more successful as a side if he didn't try and do it all his own. So the, the coach trying to get that message across to the legend that he is to say, you've got to give the ball to the dude who's free. We're not going to win a championship. You'll have some great games, but we're not collectively going to win this franchise unless you start trusting the players around you. So that that that's the that's the bit that I'm at at the moment in 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 that and and really the kind of how you manage those that ech, that echelon of player you know that's it's um, it probably has a few similarities to cricket it's a team game but very individual you know very stats individual and a lot of American sports are are like that you know very stats driven so um, you know as that head coach is having to deal with the the different personalities has been interesting how he's dealt with certain personalities and that. Um, to allow them to feel that they are the individuals they are, um, as long as it doesn't conflict what the team is about. Um, and I suppose there's an element, a lot of that's on the players themselves as well, of them being allowing for that. You know, So there's been some, definitely some left field man management skills that I've just seen in the last couple of episodes that I've seen. But just a real eye-opener. I'm always fascinated, like Pop said, when you're read, reading lots of books, um, Sometimes it can be quite confirmation bias. You just read about the good stuff. You just read about the Bulls and the Niners and the Patriots and the All Blacks and it can all be quite sort of, well, it's obvious it's all correct. Um, but I don't mind seeing the Sunderlands Till I Die and the four-year plan and just seeing the, the, the reality of why it's not all perfect um, and it never is. So there's a, lot, there's a lot of good stuff out there and this is definitely one of them. You know, I was big, it was the only time I really enjoyed basketball was around the 90s when I was a youngster. So it's, it's sort of quite nostalgic watching that. It's interesting you mentioned Sunderland Until I Die. I watched the second series over, I reckon, two evenings and couldn't get enough of it. I mean, I, I found it absolutely fascinating. And it's in, it is interesting because, you know, we, we all three do things like this where we talk about coaching, we, we sell a positive message. I, I said... In the last few years, the best thing that ever happened to me as a coach was getting the sack at Kent because I had a three-month period away from the game where I had a chance to work out actually what sort of coach that I want to be. I was far too emotional, kicked everything, punched everything and lived every defeat really, really badly. And I look at coaches who can look after themselves, can control their emotions better. Um, and it's something I've had to work really, really hard um, to do and the, the, the tough periods 
and you, you mentioned earlier, you know, injuries, um, tough periods as a player. The, the tough side um, definitely helps to shape you as a coach um, a, a, around your players. The, and the, the, the empathy versus sympathy bit is always an interesting one for me. You, you need to have a certain amount of empathy, but you also need to have be able to tell your players the truth as well. And that's not always getting that balance right, is it, as well? No, and I, I, don't, I don't know for a fact, but I don't think I see Michael Jordan being a head coach of a basketball team, you know, because of the traits that he had as a player. Yeah. I'm not sure he, he, can, think that, he can think that way, and that's why he reached the, the levels he, that he reached. You know, he's the greatest ever, as far as I'm concerned. So I think dealing with, dealing with the difficulties you come up against, like, yeah, the, 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 the control you have, the lack of control you have, is, is, is fascinating. And I will say this, you know, all the coaches in this room, is, we're always going to be, I suppose, in more news crickets about development. You know, no one's going to be questioning you coaches that oh, you're under 13s, didn't win the trophy this year, and you had, you know, not a 60% win ratio, you should have higher, blah, blah, blah. It's about trying to create players that are going to reach the next level. And as a head coach, we're going to, I'm always tussling with performance versus, you know, um, guys developing. And I suppose the way of winning that is if you're developing players to learn how to win, you're, you're doing the development, but you're also teaching it the importance of trying to get that, that win, trying to make sure in all situations you're looking to push a result and you're looking to win. What I probably will coach, whatever your strengths are, the, the way you are as a coach probably will get highlighted when that win column doesn't quite reach what it should reach. The things that get you there might be the things that suddenly are your weakness. You know, Andy Fowler, good example, you know, the strength of character he was, the leader he was, was what got him to number one. But then you hear all the stuff about it. Well, it was what cost him his job because he was too intense. So it kind of, you got to understand that the winning or losing will sometimes have an effect on whether what your strengths are as a coach get questioned. So it's, it's probably staying true to what you are as coaches and getting those relationships and, and being able to manage those, those good and bad times. And, and Pop, it, it, I mean, you know, everything Jim talks about there, we, we, we both, we get that. We, we can see that. Look, looking back over your period as a coach, has, has there been a standout learning for you? Something that maybe you got wrong, something that didn't quite work out how you wanted it to, that you has had a, 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 an impact on you and your coaching going forward? Yeah, there was a, was a, there was a time at Derby where... Uh, well, like, oh. Hello? Oh, there was a time at Derby... I think someone's mic was on. I think someone just shouted something. I don't know if he's ordering a beer at the bar pop. It's, it's a Derby fan. We've got a Derby fan. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> what was the question going for me? I forgot. What is, what is this? Has, has, there, has there been either a, a tough, you know, a tough period as a coach or a specific example of, of dealing with a situation or a player that actually it just did not go well, but it was a great learning for you as a player, as a coach, sorry. You froze it now, have you? I know oh, yeah. He's, he's gone, gone, gone I still. I know he's deep in thought. We'll give no, him a second. He's, he's, he's gone. Okay, well look. He's back, he's back, he's back. Oh, he's back. Do, you want me to, do you want me to answer it or are you ready to go? No, I think it's, um, when I was at Derby, the thing is, I, I think I tried to have too much control of the group, um, which was a little bit overpowering for the lads, which um, two or three years down the line, I tried to release that power a little bit and allow them to wear their own kit, wear, make their own decisions and this, that and the other. And they weren't actually ready for that then. So it just turned into anarchy and chaos a little bit, you know what I mean? So I probably tried to flip it too early. Um, so. Patience is another thing. Patience, you need to have a lot of patience um, and understanding that things aren't going to be right all the time. But if you stick to your values, if you stick to your philosophy and you stick to your morals and everything, I don't think you can go far wrong for it. Fantastic. Okay, Pop, Howard's got a great question for you here. You've got a young bowler to coach. Fast, raw, erratic young bowler or good technique but slow in pace? Would you have a preference? <laughs> Ball fast. Ball fast. <laughs> Ball fast. Once you've got that, you can't buy, you can't, this doesn't grow on trees, you know what I mean? So if you've got somebody that's fast, and over time, 
just try and make sure they're a little they try and get them safer in the action, try and get them a little bit more efficient. But if he's bowling rapid, if he's bowling rockets, um, I'd let him keep bowling them uh, and kind of just get them stronger in certain areas, developing in certain areas. But um, just let them go. Just keep build that relationship with them, build that rapport, and get them to trust you, and then basically become an agent and look after him if you're that quick. <laughs> Charles, one for you here then. Um, this is from Ben, and Ben wants to know about promoting and communicating the growth mindset in the Warwickshire setup. Uh, and he also wants to know about pressure training at practice. And he's coming around to uh, the million dollar question is how much sports psych input do we have at Warwickshire <coughs> at professional level? So you can wrap that all up in one answer, I reckon. Um, yeah, okay. Um, yeah, we're, we're, we're quite big on, on focusing on that growth mindset with, with when you're developing your players. <clears throat> you know, I've seen far too many players who will who shy away from not almost looking like they're not good enough. And we try, and it's trying to get these youngsters and we're really lucky actually this group of youngsters we're coming in, not only do they love Warwickshire, they love playing for Warwickshire and they're keen to, to improve. Um, they want to be tested. And that is, that is one of those true traits of, of a growth mindset. It was how am I going to improve? You know, I might fail today, but my failure today is going to what make, make me successful down the line so I don't need to protect I don't need to be I'm um, a really talented and I've been called a talented under 16 17s player and I've only ever been used to success these guys are coming in with eyes wide open going no I know I need to improve and I want to be knocked back and I want to get better so you know we're lucky that we've got this group coming through now that bodes really well for the future um, in terms of psych provision you know we, we've had a sports psych from the you know early days we, we had a sports psych who we might see once a pre-season you know, um, then we had maybe one we'd see five times a year. That's definitely developed um, as, uh, as 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 during my back end of my career and, and now into coaching. We have we have a, a sports site that works with this, and he's going to be working for over well, he was going to be working for over was it forty odd days in, in the season. We came out to La Manga with this. His name's Matt, um, and he he his role really is to help. You know, my message to a sports site is. I want you to improve the players like we're improving the players um it's not simply an agony aunt who sits and just lets them whine for 20 minutes it's about actually how do we how do we work on the strengths that they've got and how do we deal with the weaknesses and how do they manage their own game and manage them as human beings with the stuff that can you know outside the game as well as in um like you said incredibly lucky with um our, you know the pdws we have from the pca as well to deal with other stuff you know um, other behaviours that can affect cricket outside. Um, but yeah, having somebody who just gives them the tools, doesn't do it for them, because again, it's like the coaching. They need the tools to be able to manage the ups and downs that cricket will throw at them. And, you know, we can say that there are a lot of ups and downs. And being able to deal with that is what can set, set you on a long career or, or really cut your career short. Because of ultimately, that growth mindset, people who don't want to experience the negative usually don't end up in the game because they don't push themselves, they don't develop, and people, you know, end up taking their place in the team. And if, if you've got a player in your um, in your setup who perhaps is a bit indifferent to sports psych, and, and you know they're not that keen on delving too deeply into their, their mindset, what, what do you do to to make sure that they still get the same level of support? What, what things have you tried to maybe help them understand themselves and their game? It's, it's different method. Look, they've got to do their journey as well. You know, that it's, they're maybe at their point where they don't want to hear that, you know, and you're going to literally bang your head against a brick wall. It's almost like um, analysis. You know, when we do analysis, some guys love analysis. Other guys literally have no interest in doing it. You know, they don't care about the opposition. They don't want to talk about the opposition, but in a squad of, 14 or in, a, in a, an entire squad of 20 odd if one or two people really need that it has value and that likewise with psychology you know some guys might come to it differently or later I know early in my career it was something I didn't really think about later I think oh, I wish I'd learn a few of those tools you know from doing my level four um, to learn a little bit more about the things that I experienced that I didn't realize that everyone else does because I didn't really talk about them you know you kind of just got on with it um, so that, that you can't force someone to use these methods or use these tools, 
what will happen after a while, probably, if they are struggling mentally and they are struggling with their game, is you, you've got black and white you know, objective data. You're averaging 10 or you're going at over fives and you're, and you're not picking up wickets and you're not doing your job in the team. There are the obvious facts. How can we help you? Yeah. And usually there will be a point where someone hits a rock bottom and then suddenly they become a little bit more open. Um, but you can't, you can't rush that. I think sometimes they have to go through that journey and maybe have to go through a couple more innings or a couple more bowling spells before they do hit that rock bottom. The realisation, yeah, I probably do have a lot to work on here. Um, otherwise, you're just going to lose that relationship. If you just go, well, you know, it's not going to, it's not going to get the impact. They need to almost sometimes find that journey. And it's not to say we, me and Pop have loads of conversations about this. Well, you've got to tell them. You've just got to tell them right now. But sometimes it's getting the timing of that and whether or not it will have the impact. Yeah, fantastic. Um, Pop, I've got a good one for you here. Matt's posing the question, which you have mentioned books earlier. Um, would there be one good coaching book that you would recommend? Um, I wouldn't say there's one that stands out. There's a lot of... Um, there's a lot of different bounce was a good one by Matthew Saeed. Um, that was a good one. He's brought a black box thinking out. It's not so much coaching. It's how you, you think about coaching. It's how you think about how you're delivering things. Um, so there's not so much a coaching book. There's just a lot of different ones that I've, um, I listened to, um, Simon Sinek. I listened to a lot of things he says on the, on the about the why. Um, Jordan B. Peterson, I'm into him, the 12, 12 Rules of Life at the moment. Um, there's a lot of different things you pick from a lot of different books um, that I just try and apply, just like I said before, not just in the coaching, but in, in everyday life of dealing with people. Okay. Droughts, have you got a book that you would, uh, you would pick up and read? I do, but I've forgotten, I've forgotten the exact name of it now. Wait right there. <laughs> It was, I definitely remember when it's, I don't know if it's that, Pop might be able to help me, something about like, golf's not simple or something, it's not, I can't remember. Ah, yeah, 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 yeah. Um, uh, yeah. Jim, um, <laughs> he's done a book, he's done about five books, the guy. Yeah, is it, is it, is it, is it Bob Rotella? Bob Rotella, maybe? Bob Rotella. Yeah. Bob Rotella. Yeah. So Bob I do Rotella. think there's one about golf that he does, that, and I, this is before I started playing golf, so this is yeah. sort of, I reckon towards the middle to late part of my career as a player and, and Tony Frost was, it was the year I think Tony Frost scored like a thousand runs in, in like 10 games in, in, in 2008 and he was reading this and it was, it was really about process, about doing your processes, doing your pre-delivery and being able to stick to that because then you stay in the present. So that was a massive eye-opener for me and I wish I'd read that really old, 15 years before but that would be something that definitely hit home. Over my shoulder I've got Bob Warmer's um, art and science of cricket, which I always delve into, because I mean he was way ahead of his time with the stuff that he talked about. And even in there now, there's stuff, there's stuff there that's so relevant. You know, even the transition of a side, a successful yeah. team, and the sort of transition they'll go through from being successful to then suddenly, probably the performance waning off, the realization, and then how you rebuild and start again. So there's been a lot of stuff in terms of big squads and and, and the team element as well as the technical stuff, but. Um, yeah, Rotella is, is definitely someone I'd, I'd read. Yeah, and John Hilliard has typed in to say, golf is not a game of perfect, is that's one a, of the, is, in, in the uh, thing. And I, it's interesting that you mentioned that because I had a young player at Kent who was who is still playing the game, not at Kent anymore, he plays at another county and, and done very well. Um, batsman struggling, he was about 19, 20, and I listened to him one day talking amongst the lads and I could tell he was struggling and I went and bought two or three of those Bob Rotella books and gave them to him and uh, he said he had no interest. So I put them in his bag um, and about two or three months later he said to me one day, um, do you know what? He said, uh, I've been reading them golf books that you stuffed in the bottom of my bag. I said, right, any good? And uh, he said, best psych books I've ever read. And uh, on the same thing, the last Ashes, we were in Adelaide um, when we got pumped and Stuart Broad um, was talking one evening about his putting. And um, so I went and bought him that, the golf, golf is not a game of perfect. And I gave that to him the next day and said, 
when you read it, have a read of, on the section on putting, but maybe just change the word golf to cricket. And it, he was like, all right, okay, chucked it down. And two weeks later said, I can't put that book down. It's unbelievable. One of the best books I've ever read. And it is such a simple, small paperback, but it's full of great stuff. It's absolutely yeah. full of great stuff. So um, the... Uh, now we, we, we've come to the end, I think, of our time. I, I've still got loads of questions. We could we could go on till ten o'clock tonight. There's a few more questions coming in. To so everybody that's sent your questions in, thank you very much. Um, some really really good questions. I think it's made the two guys really think. Hopefully, it's given some great answers. Um, to Pop and to Jim, thank you very much for being so open and, and sharing your thoughts. I, I think we'll have all have enjoyed it. Um, and before you two go. Um, I'll start with you, Pop, and finish with you, Trouts. What if, if there was one thing that you would share with with the coaches that are on this call to help improve not only the players but to improve themselves as coaches? What would it be, Pop? Um, the. the... I'd say the one thing is share the share the knowledge, share the wealth, share what you know. You know what I mean? Because it just might be one thing that if you have some dialogue that you can take from it. So don't be shy to ask questions. Don't be shy to put your thing forward. Gents, if you see us down on the ground and you've got some questions, if you want to come, feel free to just come up, tap us on the shoulder and ask us these questions. Because as coaches, if we are expecting the players to get better then we've got to expect to try and challenge ourselves as well and that can come from anywhere i think that's what to anybody all of the bowlers and all the lads that the person i try and speak to so just take time to talk to somebody yeah. don't just walk past the man on the gate he might have that little nugget that you will that you will never ever hear from anybody else so share the wealth start yeah. dialogue listen, talk um, yeah. And that's why I've really enjoyed this tonight, Fabian. I just want to thank everybody for listening. Um, it's the first one I've done. I was a bit, little bit worried about it, and I hope it's come across well. But I've really, really enjoyed it, and it's, it's, it's put me under pressure a little bit today. I've been about it all day. So, well, we've challenging had, yourself. We've had subtitles uh, on the bottom of the screen for you, so we're all good on that score. But no, thank uh, you. I said yeah. I had to speak. So. I had to speak. Yeah. So. Brilliant. Did you Shut share up. the bell? Sorry. What, what would your, to, to finish off, to the coaches here in the group, what, what, would you, what would your little bit of advice be to take away? To not, as I say, we, we all take as a given we're about improving players. What would yours be to improve yourself as a coach? Um, I think less is more. I think it's too, it's too easy to think I'm a coach. What I've got to do is I'll change 18 different things with this player. And then as soon as I see improvement, I pat myself on the back and I say, well done. I've done myself and my job is justified have the confidence to just listen like pop said earlier listen but listen and actually when you say how are you actually care about what the answer is because i think if anything's been highlighted from what we're going through in the world at the moment is a lot more people are doing that now is you know rather than saying how you doing and then you come and you don't really listen for the answer with your players if they know and i know working with the, the coaches that i know I, you know, I loved working with is they asked how I was and they cared what I had to say and they were listening. Um, and you'll find out a lot more. You might have guys who, who are just not talkers and they clam up and they might clam up because they're just shy. So you've got to get to know them more and, and coach that up. Or they might not talk because they're going through a rough time in their cricket. So it's going to take a little bit longer. But having that patience, less is more for me. Fantastic. Absolutely brilliant. Fellas, thank you again. And just to finish on, and I think both of these guys would concur with this, there's absolutely nothing wrong as a coach saying you don't know. There's nothing yes. wrong with saying, leave it with me, I'll go and find out. Because you, you're not expected to know everything. You're definitely not expected to know everything as a coach. And there's nothing wrong with getting things wrong. You ask players to put themselves out of their comfort zone, to try something, maybe to take two steps backwards to go forwards. There's nothing wrong with you doing that as a coach. You know, Trout's mentioned earlier some un plan sessions if you like some chaotic sessions there's nothing wrong with that i know we all want our sessions to look good but actually sometimes just first two or three minutes of your session planned and then let's let the, the players take you where they want to take you 
and have a bit of fun doing that. And I'm just going to finish on one little saying that I pinched from a sports psychologist quite a few years ago, which has helped me. I haven't always been able to live by it, but I've tried to, which I think applies to all of us as coaches, and it definitely applies to the way these two guys have spoken tonight. They'll never remember what you said. They'll never remember what you did, but they'll always remember how you made them feel. And I think that's a great thing for a coach to take away. So, you know, some brilliant insights, some brilliant sharing. There's lots of messages coming through from people on here saying how much they've enjoyed it. So Pop and Jim, thank you very much indeed. Absolutely brilliant. Thanks for sharing your knowledge. Thanks for sharing your time. And thanks to everybody that's, uh, that's tuned in to join us. And I hope you've got something good out of your evening and you can get back to uh, Millionaire now and see if you can answer a few questions. So uh, thank you very much. Chat again soon. Thank you, lads. Bye-bye. Thanks. 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 Than